everyone. So we're still on our journey using the different seven tools for measuring quality as defined by ASQ. And uh, today we're going to be talking about control charts. And these are extremely powerful and they can be almost overwhelming for many people, especially those who haven't had formal study in statistics. And so my approach today is going to be very focused on the utility of control charts. There are lots of different videos out there that focus on the statistical principles of control charts. And there are other videos that talk about how to program in Excel. And honestly, in many respects, those individuals who have prepared those videos have done a better job than I could ever do. I want to focus on the utility of control charts within food manufacturing operations. But that said, Knowing that many of the graduates of the Niagara College program go out to become quality assurance technicians and eventually quality assurance managers, I want to make sure that you have a strong sense of how you can use control charts within food manufacturing. So, at the end of this video, you will be able to discuss the role of ASQ in standardizing methods of measuring quality, and I'm a huge fan of the standardization process that ASQ has done to make quality uniform and accessible for folks like yourselves. Do I want to determine the quality parameters worth measuring for your product or process step and identify when a control chart is a relevant uh, data analysis tool. Control charts aren't magical. They don't analyze everything, but they are fantastically powerful for the right types of data. We'll use a control chart for evaluating data quality and we'll identify trends in control charts using Lloyd S. Nelson's rules. And there have been uh, generations of statisticians who have invested time into understanding how to measure quality in uh, manufacturing systems. And Lloyd S. Nelson just happens to be um, a very important um, st a statistician in quality management and focused on some really straightforward tools that can be used by virtually anyone to analyze a control chart. Oh, and... You knew it was coming. W. Edward Stemming says the lack of knowledge, that is the problem. So let's keep on learning. Let's keep on growing. Admittedly, um, this is not something that I had to learn when I was in my undergraduate. And I've had some conversations with some of my colleagues who took food science with me. And we kept shaking our heads saying, this is so important. Why did we never learn it? That's why I'm making sure it's an emphasis now. Now, we're not just going to stop there. We get two quotes today, bonus round. This is Walter Schuhart, and he was the early statistician who actually influenced W. Edward Stemming in his work. And so Schuhart, in a paper from 1931, The Economic Control of Quality in Manufactured Products, wrote the fact that the criterion which we happen to use has a fine ancestry in highbrow statistical theorems does not justify its use. Such justification must come from empirical evidence that it works. As the practical engineer might say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. I love the fact that these statisticians keep talking about food. But really what Schuhart is saying here is that as much as there are really sound and advanced statistical theories that are proving that these systems work, focus on going out and using them. And I think Schuhart would be absolutely cheering you on as you non-statisticians go out and use control charts in a useful way. He would want to caution you and make sure that you're using them in a useful way. I'm going to um, hearken back to that word. He wants to make sure that you're not abusing the statistical principles, but I think that he would want you to get out there and use them. And honestly, there are so many different uh, control chart templates that are available through Excel because Six Sigma is honestly an extremely universal um, quality tool. So many uh, teaching resources are available and I'm going to encourage you to just jump in and try them out. So let's do that for ourselves here. Um, before I jump in though, let's 
quickly summarize why are we going to use a control chart. So this is taken from ASQ's uh, web page and paraphrased, but we're going to control ongoing processes by finding and correcting problems as they occur. And honestly, that is the fundamental principle behind all quality management. We're going to predict an expected range of outcomes for that process. And we're going to be doing that by calculating the mean value, and we're going to be evaluating the standard deviation within that data. We're going to determine whether that process is stable by statistical process control by evaluating what that mean looks like as compared to the standard deviations, and as well by comparing it against the range, the range being the high and low data points within typical samples of a product. We're going to analyze those patterns by looking at process variation from special cause or common cause. And so quite often we see variation just because it's naturally there. No machine is perfect, no system is perfect, but sometimes special cause error occurs. Murphy's Law happens. Um, people don't follow instructions. Machines break down. And so we are able to identify by using statistical process control and lock, uh, locking into some of the trends that we see in that data to know when things are going off. We'll be able to determine whether a quality improvement project should aim to prevent specific problems or make fundamental changes to a process. And as I've said uh, more than a few times, the seven tools of quality measurement often go hand in hand. And the next, the next uh, set of videos that we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about root cause analysis. And that's sort of the master uh, measurement tool of them all because it really goes into asking why. Why are we seeing the data that we're seeing? And from there, you can set your action plan to get stuff fixed. And again, it is that continuum of tools. Honestly, none of these tools works in isolation. You have to think logically and go back to your common sense and focus that um, Goldratt mentioned so many times. You have to go back to that focus and really think about why is this problem happening and what within the system can I fix to make sure that we are reducing errors as much as possible? So, from a fundamental step, so we've got a mochi ice cream machine here. Hey, don't be surprised. We're going to be doing some mochi ice cream, and honestly, we're going to go out and collect samples in subsets. So if I was the quality manager, let's say at this mochi ice cream factory, I'd be going out. Um, in the previous video, we were looking at the mean weights of the mochi to find out why we were consistently having overweight product. And perhaps this is a good analysis to run in a control chart. So if I wanted to find out why the weights were showing up as overweight, I would want to go out on any standard manufacturing run and collect some product. I can do it in a non-destructive way. So I could be going out and having my balance on the line and just subsample off the line quickly and put the product in a sanitary way back on that back on the line, provided there's no defect to the product. So collect samples in subsets. I'm going to perform my measurement, so I weighed my product. I'm going to identify the mean in that data subset, and I'm going to identify the range in the data subset. And honestly, for those of you who are following along this course, you are likely working from a, uh, a control chart template that has been prepared for you for this task. And honestly, there are so many control chart templates out there. Let's say you're in an entrepreneurship setting or you are the first quality manager that a company has had that has actually suggested this concept. Don't be surprised. Uh, um, many of the graduates from Niagara College end up going into quality management roles and they're the first quality manager who has suggested these tools. Um, but go and grab a template and start to customize it to the outcomes that you want dig into why each of the steps is functioning the way it is, and you'll start to have a better understanding how these charts work. So I'm going to just jump right into my Mochi example here. So this is the ASQ template, and for those of you who are following along uh, in the college process engineering course, I have I provided this for you in Blackboard, and you can also find it on the ASQ website in their seven quality tools um, tab under the resources. So first off um, in this, pardon me, is 
a little bit of instructions. You can go out to this link here, and that will link back out to the control chart um, web page and file. And it gives some of those summary instructions as well. We're going to go and collect a, a sample subgroup. And this function here is focused on picking how big is your subgroup to know what the mean value is going to be. And oftentimes when going out and, and doing some of this establishment work, so just keep it at one. And that just means your subgroup, each subgroup is one. And well, how does that function within a range? Well, we'll talk about that in just a moment. You can then collect upwards of 200 data points and enter it into the form at the bottom here. So if you remember, I'm just to, you're actually going to jump back to our histogram. If you remember from the histogram, we had gone out and wanted to see what the weight of the mochi were. So let's say our ideal specification weight for the mochi is supposed to be 25 grams. We did some data collection on that mochi and we collected 60 data points. What I have done is I've just taken those data points and put it into the control chart data here. Now, honestly, I have just done a plug and play, nothing more than that. And that is the simplicity of working with the table. The challenge is that it doesn't give you a lot of control to understand exactly what is going on in this table. Let me see if I can, there's my, my Wacom board has fallen off of the desk here, but if I can just, if I can give you a bit of a quick representation, I'm gonna actually jump this data point out to three. What happens if I've just switched what my subgroup size is? Instead of each of those points being treated as individuals, if we scroll back down here, you'll note now that the first three measures are being classified as one subgroup. The second three measures, or pardon me, the next set of three measures is being counted as a second subgroup, and, and so on and so on. If I jump up and say, okay, my subgroup is five, now when I take a look, we're calculating the mean of this, and that is what is showing up as this point here. That is the mean value of each of those subgroup sizes. And so if we really think about what on earth we are seeing in a really good distribution, pardon me, but you got to turn your head sideways, this is going to look like a bell curve or a normal distribution. And the data should be, pardon me, I can't draw sideways. This is silly. I'm turning my head sideways. That should be your mean value. I didn't line it up well. <laughs> I'm no good at art. That's what my PhD is not in art. Uh, that mean value, we want to see what is the tendency towards the specification value. That is one aspect that we can see in our control chart. And so we know it's high, but we also determine that in our histogram. Second of all, what we want to see in this X bar chart is where does the data lie with respect to these other lines? What are these other lines? These are the standard deviation. And so the data has done the analysis for you, and this is the value of going into using an existing template. You are not, I, I, know, I know the students in my class are not, statisticians, and I love you for it, but I want you to focus on what are you seeing in this chart and not the mechanisms until you have a more advanced understanding. Each of these lines is one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. So we have jumped up that line, and so we've got one standard deviation, two and three. What we want to see, ideally, is that all of the data points are staying within two standard deviations of the mean. And so what we're seeing is we really only have one data point out of this set that is outside of that mean. And so 
fundamentally, this process is actually quite in control, that we would just argue that the calibration is offset perhaps a little bit too high, and we can push that calibration a little bit lower so we have less giveaway on our product. Now, if we jump back here and we uh, go back to... I'm going to... Let's see if I can erase... Erase that. I'm, I've now made the subset group two. So one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations. What we want to see consistently in this X-bar chart is that everything is within control. And so the, the saying is that if it's within that two standard deviations, that it is just common cause error. Again, normal machines have fluctuations and variations and what we want to see is that consistently that is nice and tight. The challenge is if we have really really wide data occurring all the time we're going to see that actually in our range. Our range chart this is where we're seeing fluctuations of the mean of or we're actually seeing the changes in the mean over time and so Again, we want to see everything within two standard deviations of the mean value. So our typical range is pushing around one gram in this case, and our range value is actually within two standard deviations. The challenge for a food manufacturer is that that two standard deviations, in this case, is pushing us out of a manufacturing tolerance. We could be if we were below this range, we could be underweight. Now, if we were selling single mochis and those single mochis were in one portion packages, that could be extremely problematic. In the case of mochi, if you're selling it in a package of six or a package of 12, you can average the weight out so that your net weight on the total package averages out. So this is something that we have to really consider. From a, now, why do we need to worry about both of these charts? Sometimes your mean data, so if I have a subgroup of five, I could have a really, really wide range on that data that averages out to being really quite tight to the, um, the central line. And so we would see that reflected back out in a really huge range. And other times you will see a really, really tight range, but your line is off, and you've got perhaps really, really, uh, I'm going to draw this on the Wacom board here, maybe we've got really, really tight data all uh, in the eraser. Maybe all of our data is up here, and meanwhile, we need it to be down at 25. We've got a really, really tight range, but our calibration point is off on this piece of equipment. Now, let's jump back to the PowerPoint because I am going to talk a little bit about Nelson's rules. So, uh, Lloydus Nelson, back in 1984, wrote a paper um, which was in one of ASQ's um, journals that focused on how do you go about interpreting um, these control charts. And he had eight very straightforward rules, and he actually made visual tools that could be hung up in the wall of a quality management office so that a technician, such as you might be in your uh, first new job, would have a quick reference to be able to see, oh, wait a second, something's out of control. So rule one, if anything is outside of three standard deviations from the mean, that immediately is the process is out of control by special cause. And so immediately, you do need to reflect back when was this data taken? What about the logbook um, on which that data was collected? What else happened at that same time? So one point outside of three standard deviations, that is something worth investigating. Two, nine points in a row or more that are on the same side of the mean. And so 
this is something that, so for example, in, oops, pardon me, in the previous slideshow that I, I or in the example Excel file, we may have a specification mean, and we then need to look at what the X bar mean value is with relation to the specification. And if we're seeing that it's higher than the X bar, there's going to be a problem. And that could be an issue with calibration. It could be an issue with the uh, delivery, the human factors as well. Sometimes uh, I've seen it happen where people, um, line workers are portioning product and they just say, well, I should just be generous. Well, nope, generous doesn't pay the bills. <laughs> you have to be accurate. And so if you're seeing that portions are consistently over the mean, then that's something that's worth investigating. Six points in a row in a very clear trend is also worth investigating. So that's where you're seeing perhaps the effects of a machine going out of calibration in real time. Perhaps a machine not going out of calibration, but starting to fail on something like a gasket or um, gaskets are so common because oftentimes these shoe heart charts are used on uh, uh, mass of products. Seeing that sort of linear trend increasing or decreasing, that is also a sign that something's going on and worth additional investigation. Again, note how I keep saying the additional investigation. You need to go back in and figure out what occurred during the time at which this data was collected such that you see that trend. Rule four, if you see this sort of big oscillation back and forth, there's some sort of oscillation within the system. Something that often um, is tempting is switchovers on lines or use of dual heads within manufacturing lines. So if you have dual head fillers or multi-head fillers, you could be seeing oscillations within those different filling heads that, you, that manifest as observations of this type. Rule five, when you start to see numerous data points in a row that are more than two standard deviations out of the norm, you see that occurring with two in a row, two standard deviations out of the norm, then you know that there's a problem with maintaining control on the process. One in that two to three standard deviations range, that you could still chalk up to common cause variation, but two in a row, something's up. Four or five points in a row that are more than one standard deviation away from the mean, that again is also an indicator that there's something that needs to be investigated. This one's a sneaky one. 15 points in a row within one standard deviation. And this one is sneaky because very, very, very few processes have that tight a control that they are that precise over and over and over again. And what I have seen this occurring is where employees get sneaky and they're like, you know what, I feel lazy. I don't feel like going out and weighing all those mochi ice cream sandwiches today. I feel like just sitting in my office and collecting data on a chart by randomly picking numbers out of my head. And inherently, if you've got a system that, that, that is that precise all the time, your um, X bar is going to start to change the standard deviation value. Um, you start to see data like this and there's something afoot. Investigate further. Here we go, eight points in a row exist with none within one standard deviation of the mean. This is huge oscillation. So you've got two points above one standard deviation, two points below, and the level of oscillation is extreme in this case. And so again, worth further investigation. I want you to just jump in and try doing some work with some of these control charts and don't be intimidated by all of the X bar or R bar values that are floating around out there. Yes, there are tons of videos in this space and I encourage you to take the time and view more of them, 
But first and foremost, Schuhart's approach was get out there and don't be intimidated by the statistics. Use the statistics to your advantage. And as you're going along, ask more questions so that you are learning more and able to capitalize against the power that these control charts are able to provide. Honestly, um, what we have just seen is what's called an X-bar or R-bar chart. There are other types of control charts, but this is going to cover off a lot of the typical analysis that you will see within food manufacturing. So again, don't just burn your toast. You've heard this before. Investigate, investigate, dig into your problems, use lots of measurement tools, and figure out what's causing the biggest impact on your quality using our PDSA cycle. So I always love to hear from you and I enjoy hearing your feedback on these videos and love to hear about your suggestions for the next videos that I should do. Take care and we'll talk soon.